Hi, Paulo. Hi, Lisandra. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you, all, of, all of you again. I hope you have enjoyed the Invited Pepper session on statistical learning. Brilliant speakers. They are references in data science area in Brazil. They have uh, written our event, event, shared their knowledge with us on different point of uh, view it was so also <laughs> yes indeed now we are moving on uh, to our um, third keynote speaker uh, our speaker is uh, Vera, Vera allen and i have known Vera for a few years it is a great pleasure to have her with us today i'm going now to to give a brief not so brief introduction to her she she looks very young but she has done a lot of things so Genevera Allen she is associate professor of electrical and computer engineering statistics and computer science at the Rice University and an investigator in the Jan and Dan Dukan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital and the Baylor College of Medicine She's also the founding director of the RICE Center for Transforming Data to Knowledge, informally called the RICE D2K Lab. Dr. Allen's research develops new statistical machine learning tools to help people make reproducible data-driven discoveries. She's known for her methods and theory work in the areas or of unsupervised learning, interpretable machine learning, data integration, graphical models, and high-dimensional statistics. Her work is often motivated by solving real scientific problems, especially in the areas of neuroscience and bioinformatics. Dr. Allen is also a leader in data science education. In 2018, she found the RICE D2K Lab, a campus hub for experimental learning and data science education. Through her leadership, the Day2K Lab, Dr. Allen developed new interdisciplinary data science degree programs, established a novel capstone program in data science and machine learning, and led RICE's engagement with corporate and community partners in data science. Dr. Allen is a recipient of several honors for both her research and educational efforts including the National Science Foundation Career Award, Rice University's Duncan Achievement Award for Outstanding Faculty, the Curriculum Innovation Award, and the School of Engineering, Research and Teaching Excellence Award. In 2014, she was named the Forbes 30 Under 30, science in the, in the part science and healthcare list. She is also an elect fellow of the International Statistical Institute and the American Statistical Association. Dr. Allen serves as an action editor for the Journal of Machine Learning Research and a series editor for the Springer Texts in Statistics. Dr. Allen received her PhD in statistics from Stanford University under the mentorship of Professor Robert Tipshirani. Tip Tip and Air Bachelors also in statistics from Rice University. 
Genovera, it is really a great pleasure and honor that you could take your time and accept our invitation. It is really a pleasure to have you here with us. And I'm sure that our, our participants will take a lot of advantage of what you have to share uh, with them today. Thank you, Genevieve. Well, thank, thank you, you very Jennifer. much for the kind invitation. Um, uh, it's really an honor to be here. Okay, should I go ahead and take it away? Yes, yes, please. The floor is yours. Okay. Go ahead. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Paulo, um, uh, for the introduction and invitation to be here. I'm excited uh, to share some of my work with you. So today I'm talking about um, some work on mini patch ensembles for discovery and inference. And um, so my research area is all focused on making data-driven discoveries. So I define this as uncovering meaningful and actionable insights from large, complex, and messy data. And I do this by developing new statistical machine learning tools to make these discoveries from data sets. But you probably noticed the title of my talk had ensemble learning in it. And so you might be saying, wait a second, ensemble learning is typically used for predictive algorithms, not for discovery. And so you might be going, what's going on today? And hopefully by the end of the talk, I can show you that ensemble learning can be used for much more than just predictive algorithms. And we can do some really cool things in discovery and statistical inference using these techniques. So to just motivate ensemble learning, ensemble learning is a class of popular techniques built by uh, taking the predictions of many weak models. Um, so for example, popular approaches include random forest, where we take an ensemble of decorrelated decision trees for classification or regression, boosting, which includes you know, things like added boost, logit boost, gradient boosting, and so forth, which is adaptive slow learning um, to build ensembles, and model stacking. So these are really popular approaches, and they have so many advantages. They're widely used everywhere, especially in machine learning for tabular data, tabular or kind of matrix value data. So these really give state-of-the-art, off-the-shelf performance. So in terms of Kaggle competitions and machine learning, the number one uh, methods for tabular data still are ensemble methods, typically random forest and gradient boosting. They tend to avoid overfitting, they lead to lots of robustness and stability, and there's very wide applicability and flexibility of these methods for prediction. But you might be wondering, well, how do we interpret these methods? Uh, how do we make discoveries or do statistical inference with these methods? Is there any statistical theory for that? And so there's still a lot of open questions about these approaches. I'm going to talk about a specific type of ensemble learning today that we've termed mini patch ensembles. Mini patch ensembles are basically a double subsample of the rows or observations of our tabular data and the columns or the features of our data matrix. So for example, if this is our original data matrix of observations or subjects by features or variables on the columns, we're going to take a double random subsample, so a subset of the rows and a subset of the columns. So if we permuted this data matrix, we'd see this little patch here, and that's why we call it mini patches. And the idea is we're going to take many random of double subsamples of mini patches to form an ensemble. And we're going to fit some type of model to every one of these different mini patches, random mini patches, and ensemble the results together um, to build a predictor or some type of discovery or inference um, technique. So um, the name is inspired by, of course, mini batches often used in stochastic optimization in machine learning and also patches from image processing. And interestingly, the idea of double subsampling was first proposed in the context of random forest as a way to make them more memory efficient. But it really hasn't been studied much at all um, or employed too often. Definitely has not been studied from a statistical perspective. Um, the advantages of this approach are immediately obvious from a computational perspective. Um, these are much faster. You're fitting to tiny, tiny subsets of your data. Um, it's embarrassingly parallelizable and fully distributed and very memory efficient. If you have an enormous data set that you can't even load into computer memory, um, no problem. Each mini patch is so tiny, it's very easy to load into memory. So lots of advantages here. 
And just to show you, we can absolutely use mini patch ensembles for prediction tasks. So uh, what I'm showing you here is um, uh, five different benchmark data sets and classification for machine learning. And um, we built a random forest showing you in blue and a mini patch forest in red. And this plot is showing you the accuracy of mini patch forest versus random forest. And you see, basically, the accuracy is the same, except this data set is a sparse data set where we do quite a, a bit better than the random forest. But our computational time is faster. And just so that we were fully fair, we did not implement our method in a distributed manner for these data sets at all. And we were still faster than random forest. So um, once we implement them in a distributed way, it's quite a bit faster. But um, this is for supervised learning or prediction task. And ensemble learning is very widely used for this. Again, these are the most popular off-the-shelf methods for supervised learning with tabular data. But uh, what we want to do is use these for data-driven discovery and inference. So specifically, our goal is to leverage these strengths of ensemble learning and specific advantages we're going to see in mini-patch learning to develop some new procedures in this area and um, introduce some new statistical theory for this as well. So I've been doing a lot of work in this area. And in this talk, I just want to highlight a couple of examples um, from discovery task and inference tasks. Specifically, we're going to focus on feature selection, clustering, um, if I have time, a little bit on graph learning. And I definitely want to end with inference for features in a model agnostic manner. So let's talk about feature selection first. The goal is we've got a really uh, large number of features, perhaps a high dimensional data set. And we want to select a subset of features for modeling purposes. And of course, um, this has a number of advantages. And there's absolutely tons of prior literature on this. Um, this is a hint about the lasso, if you were wondering what this really means. Um, and so uh, there's just a ton of work already on uh, feature selection um, uh, in high dimensional statistics. But have you seen anything on ensemble learning for feature selection? Um, perhaps this is a, a, a bit of a newer area. And there has been some work, and um, this is entitled Stability Selection, it first introduced by Meinhausen and Buhlmann in, in 2010. And what this is, is they basically run the, take uh, typically subsets of the observation, so subsampling the observation, and they fit a lasso um, to each one of the subsets, and then they average whether a feature was selected or not, and here they're plotting the selection probabilities as a function of lambda. And you can see the true variables that were in red came to the surface here. So there is some work on ensemble learning for feature selection. So we said, OK, well, given this, um, and, and there's a lot of advantages uh, to this work, it really, it really gives a very strong uh, feature selection performance. Under certain conditions, you can show that it does have some type of family-wise error rate control, FDR control. Um, and uh, we were wondering, can we extend this and can we improve upon this using mini patches? And so um, our first uh, uh, approach was just very simple. Um, why not, instead of just subsampling observations, do this double subsampling of observations and features? We call this STAMPS, or Stable Mini Patch Selection. Um, my student named this. <laughs> and um, we apply like incredibly simple feature selectors to each mini patch. Each mini patch is tiny, tiny subset of the data. And we apply very simple things like we just threshold the ordinary least squared solution. Super simple. But under some assumptions, we can show that stamps controls the family wise error rate or FDR, and it's super fast computationally. But there is a problem with this approach. So if the mini patches are tiny, tiny subsamples of your original data matrix, and you've got a big high dimensional uh, data set, a lot of those features are probably noise features, right? And have no signal whatsoever. And so the performance might degrade a bit. So our solution and our the main innovation here is we said, well, what if we adaptively sample our subsets of features instead of randomly sampling them? And we're going to adaptively sample them uh, using multi-arm bandits from reinforcement learning and machine learning. 
And just in case you're not familiar with multi-armed bandits, they always just show this picture of this octopus playing slot machines, but it really is evocative of what's going on here. So the idea is imagine you've got several different states and each one has a probability. In our case, we've got several different features. We don't know which of those features are the true features or not when we first start. So we kind of need to explore the landscape and try several different features to see if any of them are the true features. But once we start knowing which are the true features, we want to sample those features more frequently. And this is what a multi-armed bandit scheme is doing, is adaptively learning which are those important features. And so we call this method ad ad adaptive stamps or add a stamps. So our algorithm kind of proceeds as follows. There's a burn-in stage where we just do random subsampling of features. But then after that, there's an adaptive stage. And we have an exploration and exploitation scheme. In the exploration scheme, we randomly sample a small number of features with a fixed probability um, in order to make sure we're not missing any features that might actually be important, especially if we have a really huge data set. Um, but we also employ an exploitation scheme, which is if we know a feature is important and that feature has been selected frequently, it's likely that that feature is a signal feature. And so we want to sample those with a much higher probability uh, so we can really learn which are the best features. And so we do this and then we update the active, uh, uh, active feature set and we keep sampling in this manner. So this is a very uh, common multi-armed bandit uh, scheme. So just to show you this in practice, what I'm showing you here is the stability score of all of the features. This is a simulation that's a really hard simulation. It's, it's an ultra high dimensional sparse linear regression sim, um, simulation. So this is a situation where even running the straight lasso does not perform well at all. And the signal features are in red and the noise features are in gray. And there's a ton of noise features because this is a really big data set. And we're plotting the stability score zero to one. One means that feature is really, really important, and zero means it's not. And this is with stamps here. You can see it's kind of a big jumbled mess, and it's hard to separate what the true features are from the noise features. But here is with adaptive sampling running this exploration ex exploitation scheme. And this is a burn-in phase, and you see after that burn-in phase, adaptive sampling really immediately allows us to learn which are the true features. And this is where exploration kicks in. This feature initially was discarded and, and we're like, oh no, that's not an important feature, but it was randomly sampled and was like, oh wait, maybe it is important. And it came into the model more frequently. So um, this is how the scheme works. And you see immediately a really, really hard problem where when we don't use adaptive sampling, you can't separate the true features from the noise features, but suddenly with adaptive sampling, you can. And so this is really a major advantage of this approach. So we've got a ton of simulations um, in the paper. This is, I'm, I'm showing you just one example here. This is a really big data set. So about 335,000 features. Um, and this is very highly correlated data as well. So an extremely hard problem. What we're showing you here is the F1 score, um, meaning uh, a feature selection. So one means perfect recovery of the true feature, zero means imperfect recovery, as well as the computational time. And here we're doing like lasso with cross-validation or BIC um, stability selection and several other methods as well. Our adaptive sampling scheme is in red at the top and we see um, that it actually has perfect feature selection performance on this super hard data set. And it took about 12 minutes to run um, on this example. The second best performing method other than ours was the randomized lasso. And this actually took 20 hours to run on this data set, showing you kind of the computational advantages also. And here we're just showing this. This is very model agnostic. We don't need to apply this just with the lasso. And so here we're applying this with random forest and with um, multi sparse multinomial regression for a classification task as well. And this is a very hard, uh, high dimensional problem on single cell RNA sequencing where there's um, almost 30,000 genes. And what we're doing is um, we apply our method to select the top one to the top 10 features. And for each of these, we refit a model just with those features and uh, report the accuracy on a new test set. 
And you see that our uh, add a stamps method, which is in red, really selects the correct features. By about three features, it almost has perfect accuracy on a downstream classifier in a random force, um, whereas other approaches really do not perform as well. Um, and uh, we can really see this uh, in an unsupervised way as well. This is the original high dimensional data set. This is a UMAP visualization of this data and the cell types uh, in 30,000 dimensional space. And we actually reduced the dimension here down to three using only three selected features from our random forest version of Atostamps. And we see like very good separation of the cell types and a much clearer picture of what's going on. So this is another kind of validation that we found something biologically fairly interesting in our approach here. Um, so overall in feature selection, we are able to use ensemble learning and adaptive sampling of the features to really learn um, which are the better features in a very computationally efficient manner. So we're gonna do something similar in clustering. In clustering, the goal is to find groups of observations. And of course, there's tons of great approaches to clustering, k-means, hierarchical, uh, hierarchical clustering, mixture models. Now you might be wondering, is there any ensemble learning in clustering? Um, well, there is something similar to ensemble learning, and this is a, a consensus clustering approach introduced in 2002. And the idea of this is, you, is to subsample the observations and apply a clustering method and then to ensemble the co-cluster occurrences. So let me just show you a picture so you really know what this means. Um, so what you're looking at here is a heat map of the consensus clustering matrix, where here we have observations by observations. And so this would be like an N by N matrix of the observations. And the color scale, yellow means um, no co-cluster occurrences for those two observations together, whereas dark blue means those two observations appear in clusters together often after we've subsampled this randomly many times. So if we look at this, um, this is an example for a very hard um, problem from single cell sequencing. And if we look at this example, perhaps you say here, wow, well, these clusters are really um, dark blue tight together, so perhaps these observations tend to co-cluster together all the time under ra different random sampling schemes. So these probably are a cluster that was found together. So there's a lot of advantages of this approach. It's used often to um, for hyperparameter tuning or to choose the number of clusters in clustering methods, but it's also, it helps improve clustering performance and really allows you to assess the reliability of your clustering approaches. Now, some disadvantages are that it might be more computationally prohibitive and lack interpretability. Um, so to just show you how you would understand the reliability of this, perhaps this is a tight cluster and maybe this is a tight cluster, but this group right here, it looks like it's unclear that like, there might be some confusion whether this is a separate cluster or not, or how many clusters are in this data set. So it does give you some notion of how reliably each observation was clustered. So uh, our question is, can we improve this approach with mini patches and do mini patch consensus clustering? So what we do here is we actually use a similar multi-arm bandit scheme to what we developed for feature selection, but now we're gonna use this in clustering and we're going to do this by adaptively sampling observations and features instead of just features. Oh, and we call this impact, uh, my student named this also, interpretable mini patch adaptive consensus clustering. And the idea here is that we want to uh, speed up our clustering performance by exploiting the observations for which there's a high degree of clustering uncertainty. So we're going to sample those more so we can learn the cluster assignments better and more quickly. But the features, we really want to understand which features exhibit differences across the different clusters. So we basically uh, sample more frequently the features that exhibit differences across the clusters as we do um, uh, mini patch sampling. And so uh, with this scheme, this tends to perform really well. And I'm actually going to skip some of the results and just show you pictures 
of how this performs. So the computational time is way less than regular consensus clustering, but the uh, amount of reliability of our models is greatly increased. So what we're showing you here are three different genomics data sets that are really big and very challenging to cluster. And on the top row is the results, results of our method, MPAP, and on the bottom row is a consensus clustering approach. So the, the initial kind of uh, proposal for uh, ensemble learning and clustering. And we can see, um, looking at some of these examples, let's look at this example right here, it looks like with regular consensus clustering, there might be some confusion between this cluster and this cluster. Some of these samples, it looks like might belong to either of these clusters, whereas there's a lot less confusion in our approach. And you can see that um, we really do offer improved uh, clustering performance with much faster computation. Um, so there's a lot of advantages of using this adaptive sampling scheme in clustering as well as in feature selection. Um, so I, I also should mention, I'm going to move on to the next one. Again, I'm just trying to give an overview of these things, but feel free to ask questions. Also, I'm happy to take questions as I go. Um, so very briefly, um, we can also use uh, uh, mini patch learning for graphical models. And this is learning the conditional dependence relationships amongst the set of features. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, and just it, so I can it, make sure and have lots of time for discussing inference um, and say our approach is actually turns out to be incredibly simple. What we do is we randomly sample these mini patches and we fit little tiny graphs to them. And it turns out that even though fitting these little tiny graphs does not learn the conditional dependent structure of the whole relationships amongst the features, we can still solve a quick latent variable graphical model problem using the threshold of graphical lasso, which is um, a recent uh, paper of ours on solving this problem quickly, an ensemble that edges over all these mini patches and retain those frequent edges. And uh, we actually theoretically can show that this gives finite sample graph selection consistency with even weaker assumptions than that of the graphical lasso and other methods. And this is also really fast and memory efficient. So just to convince you um, uh, that I know I didn't go over the details of this, but I just want to highlight some of the results in case you're interested in going back and, and, and looking at this further. So this is a simulation that's, I mean, high dimensional, um, so a little bit challenging. And um, uh, my former student uh, who worked on this, Tianyi, implemented every single uh, software package for graphical modeling available in Python or R and compared them to our approach in red here in terms of the F1 score. So one over here is perfect recovery of the graph and zero is imperfect recovery. And you see our method actually performs the best out of all of these methods, followed by this method in blue here. And um, in terms of computational time, it was able to do these in around 40 seconds, whereas this blue method actually took nearly 10 hours uh, to run uh, on this particular example. So um, quite a bit faster. Um, and we apply this to a really huge data set from neuroscience with 14,000 neurons in it. And our estimate took uh, 11 uh, minutes to actually run. And the next fastest method took over 11 hours to finish on this particular data set. And here's an example of the network we were able to learn. And there's some very interesting neuroscience findings, which I'm not going to have time to go over here. But essentially, again, we use mini patches here to really speed up the computation of graph learning. And also, uh, this double sub sampling yielded not only faster computation, but actually improved statistical performance as well in this example. OK, I wanted to make sure to have, leave plenty of time to conclude on feature importance inference. Because I think this is another uh, doing inference with ensemble learning is perhaps something that nobody's really seen before. It's a bit new, but it's a really interesting approach to performing statistical inference. So I definitely want to highlight this. So the motivation for doing this is um, working in interpretable machine learning. And so machine learning methods, and what we're talking about predictive systems now. 
They're being used in healthcare, national security, finance, autonomous vehicles, and many, many other situations where it's really critical um, to make the, the right decisions. And many people say, well, can we really trust machine learning in these like kind of mission critical situations? Like how much do we trust these approaches? And many people say, well, to build trust, we need to make all these machine learning methods interpretable or explainable. Um, and that's great. And there's been a ton of uh, proliferation of techniques in this area for doing so. But we ask, wait a second, sure, we can make these methods offer some type of interpretation or explanation of these methods. But can we really trust those interpretations? Like, do you really trust the interpretations that are spit out by really big deep learning systems in machine learning? And this is where we really need something like statistical inference to help us understand the uncertainty in these interpretations and whether we should trust them. So in this work, we are working with a particular type of popular um, uh, machine learning explanation for supervised learning models, so predictive models, and this is feature importance. So feature importance is the level of influence each feature has on the model predictions. And so uh, there's absolutely tons of approaches out there for feature importance. And most of the ones you're probably familiar with are model specific. So for example, think about in linear models, the feature importance would just be the coefficient values that we estimated from linear models or in additive models or generalized additive models. This is just coefficient values. In trees, forest, and boosting, this is often the feature importance score, which is the difference in, in loss function every time um, that feature was split upon in the ensemble of trees. And there's lots of great stuff in deep learning on uh, relevance propagation and gradient-based methods to assess feature importance. So most of the work out there is, is, is interpreting features and feature importance for each model separately. But I would argue it's really important if we want to trust these machine learning systems to have model agnostic methods as well. And this model agnostic methods kind of have the same interpretation across many different models and helps us compare models and compare interpretations better than these model specific approaches. And so model agnostic methods include, include doing feature permutation approaches, uh, Shapley values from game theory, and feature occlusion. Feature occlusion very simply is leaving one feature out and seeing how it affects the predictions, uh, the prediction of your methods. And if that feature was important, uh, your prediction should be worse. And that's the idea of feature occlusion. So there's absolutely been methods for these. You're gonna find um, in machine learning software packages, different versions of these uh, available and coded up. And people use these model agnostic tools all the time in machine learning. But do we really trust what these methods are telling us? And what about statistical inference? Can we do statistical inference on these model agnostic tools? So uh, in, in a related line of work, there has been a lot of recent interest in um, predictive inference. And this is basically giving a confidence interval on predictions from machine learning methods. Sometimes this goes by the um, name conformal inference. Sometimes it's called distribution free and model agnostic uncertainty quantification for predictions. So there's a, a great body of work on this, but this is really only for predictions and not for feature importance. So what about uh, work on feature importance? There has been a little bit on feature permutation inference. Um, I would argue that, that uh, for the past couple of years, especially there's been a growth of literature on feature occlusion inference. So this is, leaving one feature out and assessing how it affects the predictive performance of your model. And so there's a lot of great approaches that have been proposed um, using different types of things like knockoffs or, or model splitting. But many of these approaches either make distributional assumptions, so you have to know the distribution of your data. They make assumptions on model consistency, which is great for applying statistical models, but doesn't really work for like random forest or deep learning. They're only applicable to regression, or they utilize data splitting, which can be shown to lose statistical efficiency and power. So our goal 
is to develop a fast assumption light and specifically very important model agnostic works for any model distribution free inference procedure to quantify the uncertainty of feature importance. So basically, we want a confidence interval every time we get a feature importance um, metric, we want a confidence interval on that metric to help us understand how important that feature is and make sure it's not looking like it's important from random noise or randomness in our training data. So um, we are inspired by um, some prior work called loco inference or leave one covariate out inference. So this was proposed by Jing Lei at, and, and many others at Carnegie Mellon. And the idea of this is to do inference on the feature occlusion scores by uh, data splitting and conformal inference. So they specifically propose the following inference target. They basically say this is the ex expectation of the difference in the error between leaving feature J out and having feature J in the model. So here, just some uh, minor notation. Mu is our fitted model without feature J here, and this is our fitted model with feature J. Error is any type of function. We're going to show that error just needs to be a Lipschitz continuous function that is appropriate for regression or classification. And this is just um, some type of error metric between our true labels and the predictions without feature J and with feature J. And we call this delta J. And so this is what we're trying to do inference on. You can interpret this as the difference in predictive power without feature J and with feature J. If you stare at delta long enough, for it, you're, you'll realize that if delta is positive, is, is kind of large positive, it indicates that that feature J was super important because the predictions got a lot worse when we uh, took out feature J. Um, and if delta J is close to zero or negative, maybe that feature was not important. And the approach they propose in this paper is to split the data into a training and test set. They fit the predictive models to the training data set, but they use the test set residual differences to construct with confidence intervals. Now, there's a ton of advantages of this approach. So it is really model agnostic, even though they only studied this for regression and only have theory for regression. Um, and it's fairly assumption light, does not uh, make any distributional assumptions, which is great. But they do split the data into training and test set, which could lose, which has been shown before to lose statistical power. And they have to fit separate models to each one of the features, leaving each feature out individually. And so this can really be computationally prohibitive to do, leaving each feature out one at a time. So our idea was, wait a second, why can't we use mini patches to help solve this problem? These mini patches have a super important feature. They subsample, remember this is double subsampling of observations and features. So naturally, when we sample a mini patch, there's lots of these observations that have been left out that were, weren't trained upon. And when we sample the features, there's also lots of other features that were left out. So we're excluding every mini patch excludes some features and observations. And can we use this to uh, perform loco inference, so this feature occlusion inference? So our approach is actually really simple. So uh, once we fit our mini patch predictor, then uh, there's no additional computation required to compute our inference method. What we do is we first calculate the leave one observation out predictor. We're going to call this mu hat of minus i. So this is basically the prediction. Um, and we just ensemble, we just sum over all the mini patches that did not contain observation i. OK, so we're just uh, we don't refit anything. We just ensemble mini patches without observation i. And then we have the local loo predictor or the leave one covariate out, leave one observation out predictor. And again, we're going to um, ensemble all the mini patches that did not contain observation i and did not contain feature j and get those. And then our feature occlusion scores for the ith observation and jth feature 
are the error of these uh, Lu predictors between the Lu predictors, leave one observation out that did contain feature J, and the, and the local Lu predictors, which does not contain feature J. And if you look at this long enough, this feature occlusion score, this really is um, on a test sample. So this is an unbiased estimator of that feature occlusion score um, because we did not use the ice observation for training here. So here error we show can be any function and it could be different from the loss function you employ that um, satisfies the Lipschitz condition. So it's continuous. So it's a pretty um, easy uh, uh, thing to satisfy. And then given these delta hat j's for each of the i's, we construct an asymptotically normal confidence intervals for the delta j's. We get a bunch of samples. We now have n samples of the delta j's, and we can construct an asymptotically normal confidence interval. And notice that this entire procedure actually was free computationally. We never did any model fitting. Once we fit our mini patch estimator, all we needed to do was record which mini patches each observation and feature were in, and we can get these mini patch um, uh, confidence intervals for free computationally without any model refitting or data splitting. So you might wonder uh, quickly if this has any theoretical guarantees whatsoever, and to just motivate this just a little bit, um, so this is actually really challenging because each mini patch is highly dependent between the different mini patches. So um, they're so dependent on each other that uh, central limit theorems for dependent um, data do not apply in this case. So this is actually pretty challenging to show, but under assumptions on the number size and the stability of our mini patch estimators, we can show that we have asymptotically correct coverage for our confidence intervals. So our confidence intervals have asymptotically correct coverage. And to do this, we actually leverage a really interesting recent paper on asymptotics of uh, cross-validation. And in a sense, um, with the, the intuition be between why this works is the leave one out estimator is kind of like leave one out cross-validation. So we could leverage a, an approach to uh, prove validity of our confidence intervals. So um, just as an aside, uh, we also show that a very uh, quick extension of our, uh, our, especially our Lou estimates, our leave one observation out estimates, can be used to provide a confidence interval for predictions. So this is if you have a new point y n, n, n plus one and a new um, uh, x n plus one, we can provide a confidence uh, uh, an interval that y will be in this interval with probability one minus two alpha. And this is under exchangeability conditions. This is finite sample. This is not asymptotic. And again, we totally get this for free from our uh, mini patch framework. So we're not doing any model refitting to get this. And this is a very fast way to get confidence intervals for your features and your predictions at the same time. So just to show you that this method does indeed seem to work quite well, um, we uh, are looking at validating the coverage results. And here we're doing our mini patch estimator for classification and regression. We've got a ton of different results in the paper, um, but I'm just showing you a subset here. And we see that we get correct. Our coverage was set to be 90% here. We do have correct coverage uh, for our estimators. And as we would expect, the width of our confidence interval decreases as n, our sample size, increases. So um, this appears to be doing well correctly. In terms of computational time, this is so much faster than loco split, the method that we were inspired by, because we're not doing model refitting. And so our method computationally is shown for several different settings in blue here, whereas loco split is in orange. And um, uh, we are especially as M gets, this is even a medium M. I wouldn't even call this a large, oh, M is the number of features here, sorry. Um, this is even a medium M. Uh, it's not even large. Uh, loco split can take a really long time. We actually stopped it after eight hours. Um, it had not finished the random forest estimator, whereas our method um, basically scales linearly with M, so it's very fast. 
In terms of statistical Shinnefera, sorry yes. for interrupting. You have about five minutes, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, uh, so in terms of statistical power of our inference procedure, um, there's been several other inference procedures proposed in the literature. This is the generalized covariance measure, the variable importance for prediction measure, CPI, floodgate, and so forth. Um, each of these, it's kind of tricky to compare them because each of these is actually a method that is testing a slightly different hypothesis. But what we did is we set up three different simulations, a sparse linear regression situation, a sparse linear regression with correlated features, and a sparse nonlinear regression um, simulation. And each of these methods, even though they're testing a slightly different hypothesis than our approach, they all are trying to do model agnostic feature importance testing. So they're all doing the same thing. And we basically said, okay, as we vary the signal to noise ratio of the first feature in this data set, um, so when it's zero, that feature is a noise feature. And when you know the SNR is very large, it's clearly a feature with very strong signal. When we vary this, each of these methods should be able to detect at some point when um, that feature is relevant. And so what we're doing here is as we're varying the SNR for that first feature, we're plotting the empirical realized statistical power of each of these approaches. Our method, loco MP or loco mini patch, is in red. And you'll notice it has comparable statistical power to many, but what's more important here is our method really does exhibit correct type one error, which should be below um, 0.1 for these situations, especially for the uh, sparse uh, situations, whereas many of the other methods do not, do not seem calibrated well in these situations. And we generally have very good statistical power compared to everybody else that has correct type one error and is well calibrated. We also show results for classification. I mentioned most of the methods out there for performing feature importance inference are designed for regression. There's very few of them that are applicable to classification. The only ones are local split CPI and um, VIM. And uh, we compare our approach to these for classification scenarios, again, using a sparse linear regression, a sparse linear regression with correlated features, and a sparse nonlinear, uh, oh, sorry, classification example. We're in classification land now. Oh, and I should say the top row is with a random forest, the bottom row is with logistic ridge regression. Um, we've got several other models in the paper as well, SVMs and deep learning uh, methods as well. This is applicable to all of them. And we see here our statistical power is quite a bit better for classification than these existing approaches. We really perform quite a bit better uh, for classification scenarios. And we also compare them um, on the same simulations, uh, and this is a regression simulation, for um, selecting features. So uh, this data set, this simulated data set had 200 features and there were 10 true features and we wanted to know what we're plotting is the F1 score. One would be perfect recovery of those 10 features. And our method is in red here. And we see in many situations, we perform quite a bit better than all of the other methods or we're among the best performing methods for uh, regression. And for classification, we are a lot better than all of the other methods. Again, kind of backing up our power results for using this for feature selection. And just to show you these confidence intervals and what we get at the end of this, this is an, an, a classification um, a data set where we're trying to classify whether someone has heart disease. This was a data set collected in Africa and several features like tobacco, tobacco use, age, um, obesity, alcohol, and so forth. And we're showing for each of these features the confidence intervals for three methods, loco split in pink, our method in red, and the CPI method in green. And you see our method, the way you should interpret these as if the lower bound of our confidence interval is greater than zero, it indicates that that feature is really, truly important. And this was fit with a random force. And it looks like tobacco use and age are definitely important via our measure. If you look at all of these other intervals, you see number one, the width of the intervals is much wider. So they've got less statistical power, but nothing else really appears to be statistically significant with these other approaches. They just don't have the power to detect the differences. 
And we see that our method selected age and tobacco is statistically significant. And these were indeed the top two uh, features selected by Random Forest Feature Importance Score. But importantly, the third most important score, LDL, our method said, no, nope, not significant at all. And you would have never known that if you just looked at the feature importance score from Random Forest. So doing statistical inference and saying, hey, these two features are different than random chance right like um these are statistical statistically significant really aids in the interpretability and trust for these machine learning methods okay so just to quickly summarize um i've introduced lots of different techniques that utilize mini patch learning or mini patch ensemble learning this is a fast distributed and memory efficient technique and the double subsampling can be leveraged for a lot of different tasks so today I talked about using it for feature selection, for feature importance inference, and also clustering and graph learning. But there's tons of other research directions. There's a lot of um, interesting statistical theory problems related to these approaches. There's a lot I, more I think you can do with ensemble learning. Ensemble learning is really powerful. And I think we can be using this for more than just prediction. Why not use this for inference and discovery tasks? And I do want to hi highlight that there are some software packages available from our uh, GitHub uh, repository if you're interested in trying out some of these techniques. And I want to thank all of my uh, students and former students that were involved in this work. Tianyi Yao, who worked on feature selection and graph learning. Minji Wang, who uh, worked on graph learning. Lily um, Zheng, who worked on uh, mini patch inference. And Lu Chen Gan, who worked on clustering and inference. And uh, we do have some references available if you're interested in reading further. Everything is available on Archive or Google Scholar. You should be able to find these uh, papers. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It is always a pleasure to listen to you. We learn, we learn a lot from your talks. Thank you, Jennifer, for your accepting our invitation uh, to share uh, your knowledge with uh, us. I appreciate your enthusiasm. It's a wonderful way to finish this conference. Thank you very much for having me. We have we have a couple of questions. I will share them here in the screen. Uh, a question from Theodore. I would like to know if the aim of inference of interpretable machine learning is the same when we are in statistics. That is a fantastic question. Um, thanks for asking. So yeah, you might be wondering this type of feature importance inference for feature occlusion, how does it relate to statistical inference techniques that we know and use all the time? So I'm going to use an example from linear models. In linear models, our feature importance inference would be probably doing some type of statistical testing on betas, testing whether the beta is equal to zero or not in a linear regression model. And we use these all the time, right? This is the type of inference we do in that setting. So it turns out we actually show that our type of inference using mini patch loco um, is actually related to, uh, boils down to testing whether that beta is, um, whether beta is equal to zero. Specifically, it's, it's a little bit more than that. It's basically whether that beta minus the average value of the betas is equal to zero or not. So um, our betas need to be, it, it's not just not equal to zero, but they need to be significantly larger than the average value of all the other betas for it to be considered important. So basically we do show that our type of inference is very closely related to inference, to traditional statistical inference in any linear model, which might make you uh, more inclined to use this. It's going, okay, wait, this is just the generalization of inference for linear models. So um, maybe I'm okay using this then in a random forest or an SVM or deep learning and so forth. Great question. Yes. I, I have another question also from Theodore. Uh, it is about um, the case of sampling of, of the population. So after training the machine learning, do we need to extrapolate the result uh, to, to the population? And, and I, I'd like to add something to that is, is how to decide the size because Mm -hmm. Of course, the results and the computational time will depend on how large somehow is your sample. Uh, so if you could comment on that, it would be great. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me comment, Paulo, on your, your question first. So uh, what is the size of the mini patches? That's a great question. I totally didn't address that. Um, uh, we do in the papers. So um, you're absolutely right. The larger the mini patches are, the more computational time. Um, so in some of our examples, like graph learning, there's a statistical trade-off in terms of accuracy versus computational time with the size of our mini patches that we need to calibrate very well. In other examples, like in our inference example, we actually show that our mini patches should be rather small. They typically need to be on the order of square root of the number of features we have in order to do correct inference theoretically. So we actually recommend just fixing them to the square root of the number of features. Ironically, this is exactly what's recommended by Random Forest without any theoretical guarantees as to why it works. We actually provide theory for why square root of the number of features is the correct one. So, and it, it's a little bit different in different applications, but um, this is an important kind of tuning parameter, not for inference. We suggest fixing those as square root and inference. Um, so the other question was also a great question. So how do we extrapolate uh, results to the population? So this is a great and very subtle point uh, from, from our inference procedure. Our inference procedure is building a confidence interval for that feature importance score. And that is conditional on the training data set because we built the model on our training data. And so our confidence interval is really a function of our training data. And it is not saying something about the population model more broadly, okay? It's just saying something about in this training sample, this feature was really important to build this predictive model on this training sample. Now, you might, as a statistician, you might say, well, we wanna say things about the population, not just your training sample. So machine learners and computer scientists want to say things about like the training sample because that's how they deploy the method and use it in practice. Statisticians want to say something about the population. So we actually showed that there is a connection between the two and that under um, certain uh, assumptions on the stability of our mini patches that we actually can, a statement about our training sample can be translated to a statement about the population in those cases and hence we can do statistical inference on the population case as well. So that's a very subtle point. Um, it's a very good question. And um, the answer is it's challenging, but in some situations we can make statements about both, which I do think are equally important. Perhaps one's interesting to computer scientists, the other to statisticians, but they're both, I, I think, an interesting uh, question. Perfect, Genevieve, thank you very much. We are out of questions and almost out of time. Uh, if anyone else has further questions for for Jennifer, I'm I'm sure that she will be happy to answer your emails and your questions. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. Yeah. Thank you for having me very much. I, I enjoyed it, so I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.
Paulo. Hi, Lisandro. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or, and good evening, depending on where you are. We have just listened a song by Chico Cesar and the beautiful interpreted by the singer Raiza Soares, accompanied by Leandro Oliveira on guitar. And the name of the song is A Primeira Vista, who... Uh, speak about uh, dreams, opportunities, and love. Yes, it was a marvelous interpretation. Uh, now we are going to, um, of course, uh, to end this conference and everything that is good and pleasant ends quickly. And we are about to end the fourth conference on statistics and data science. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as you did. But do not forget that uh, we will uh, have the um, two short course in the in the um, in the afternoon. Now I'm going to present the the results for the best paper award. Um, we had the uh, 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 best paper award on 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 statistics and data science, and uh, um, we had the evaluation committee. Um, that was was made out of the scientific program committee. I was not part of the evaluation committee because I had students applying for this award. So the the, the evaluation committee was Shun Hu from Taiwan, David Banks from the United States, Francisco Lozada from São Paulo, Luciano from from Salvador, Patrick Gronman from the Netherlands. Paula Brito from Portugal, Renato Assunção from Brazil, and Rosaria Lombardo from Italy. So it was a full international committee that we had evaluating this, uh, this, uh, this award. We had seven, seven applicants. Um, we, we considered the only applications uh, according to the rules of the website until the 20th of November. Uh, there were a couple of people that uh, wrote after that, but we, we decided to follow the rules. And each member of the evaluation committee had the, to select the best three posters from those seven and then rank them from the first to the third. Uh, the deadline for this evaluation committee was the 29th of November. And at the end of that day, I was not sure what I, I had to do or to, to break the ties because at uh, 10.45 of the 29th of November, we had four posters tied in the first place. So I was trying to think on how to break the tie and I, I, I would have to, to get back to the, to the committee. However, um, at um, 10.46, we received one, one more score from, from the last member of the, of the evaluation committee and that tie was, was broken by, by that vote. So, the results are as follows. Um, we have a tie in the third place. Uh, uh, the, 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 the award is going to Carlos Solsi mm -hmm. with the work on reverse local bots bootstrap for stationary time series with missing data. And also to Rodrigo Medeiros for the work entitled The Simple and Useful Regression Model for Fitting Count Data. So congratulations to, to both of them. Then the second place is going to João Silva uh, on the, the, the work entitled Different Faces of Defense 
studying the National Basketball Association defensive positions. Congratulations, João. And the first place is going to Luis Eduardo Gomez uh, with the work entitled The Bayesian Network Approach to Food Security Modeling in Brazil. So I'd like to congratulate all the winners. Uh, thank you for applying for the award. You will be receiving a certificate. We don't, uh, we don't charge registration fees, so we don't have money to, to give to the winners, but we, we are sure that we will we'll send you a certificate, okay? Congratulations. <laughs> it was difficult to uh, decide uh, the best. Yes, indeed. So now, now me and Lisandro, we, we would like to welcome here uh, all the members of the local organizing committee that uh, because uh, only a few of us are here uh, looking at you, but um, there is a lot of work behind and a lot of people involved. So um, I will put João in the, in the, in the, in the spotlight. João is, is helping with uh, technical details. He was the master of ceremony and is also uh, doing some, is also the host on, on some sessions. So this is Joel. Jalmar, Jalmar has done a huge and marvelous work with the website. The website of the conference is really a professional website and we are very grateful for, for all his help on that. Uh, Christian. Christian uh, is, is, uh, was helping a lot with some, some, uh, some technical details and with the book of abstracts. He did a great job with that. You, you can download the book of abstracts from, from the website. Rodrigo, Rodrigo is also helping in the background, is uh, taking care of all the list of presents, all the abstracts and, uh, and all of those details. Uh, so, uh, if you don't get a certificate of participation, you should complain to Rodrigo. <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth has been helping with a lot of things in, in the background as well, with, uh, with abstracts and with, uh, with uh, social media and with all of this uh, advertising. And we don't have here Jairan. Jairan uh, could not attend this session. But is is doing. Uh, he has been. He organized this Streamyard platform that we are using, and he was uh, uh, helping a lot with uh, with the, the the transmissions and everything. So this is the team that we had here. is not a large team, but is a very efficient and competent team, and uh, it is a great honor for me to to work with them. It is really really a great pleasure. Um, now, I, I'd like to, to thank the, the institutions that provide financial support and endorsement, especially endorsement to this conference, uh, in particular to the Department of Statistics of the Federal University of Bahia, the specialization in data science and big data of the Federal University of Bahia, the Brazilian Statistical Association, the Brazilian region of the International Biometric Society, the CONR3, the American Statistical Association, the International Society for Business and Industrial Statistics, to the Special Interest Group on Data Science from the International Statistical Institute, to the International Association for Statistical Computing, and to the International Statistical Institute. Uh, the, their endorsement it is a kind of, of stamp for the quality of the organization that we have been doing and that we have been bringing to all of you. Last but not least, we need to thank on behalf of the Scientific Program Committee. We would like to thank all our speakers, the keynote speakers, the lecturers of the short courses, the discussants in the round tables and the poster presenters. Without their contribution, we could now not have a scientific program in such a, a, a high, high quality. And of course, I would like to thank all the participants for being here. We have had all of this effort to bring something special to you. We hope that you, you enjoy it. Now, I, I will share a few statistics of the conference. We have almost 130 communications, including 
keynote and invited speakers, short course presenters, roundtable discussants, and uh, poster presenters. We had more than 600 registered participants from 47 countries. Uh, from those, 36% were women, 63% men, 42% were working in academia, 18% were undergraduate students, 14% PhD students, 10% uh, master students, and 10% colleagues from industry. Um, the conference website was visited almost 15,000 times since it was advertised. That's a, a lot of, uh, of uh, attention to it. And the, the people that visit the website were coming from 77 different countries, which is quite impressive. On YouTube, we have some statistics from only from the first two days because YouTube only gives the, the, the st only updates the statistics in the end of the day. In the first two days, we had almost 2000 visualization for a total of more than 450 hours watched. So it is a, a quite nice number that uh, that we see that uh, there is a lot of interest in the community for for this conference. Uh, the opening ceremony and the first keynote lecture by Alex Alexandra Smith uh, had already uh, more than 400 visualization. So thank you for your participants partici for participating in this conference. We would like also to hear uh, your opinion so that we can improve next time. So we will be sharing uh, the, the link for the survey. Uh, so please um, write your opinion and fill in the survey so that we can we can uh, do better next time okay and uh, now i'm going to pass the word to my very dear friend and colleague <laughs> lisandra uh, she has been uh, um, doing a lot of work in this organization she led the, the local organization in a, in a, in a marvelous way and uh, I am I'm very honored to have her as a friend. So it is. I'm going to pass her the word so that she can say a few words. Thanks, Paulo. Um, I'd like to thank um, all attendees for participating to this fourth conference on statistics and data science during these three days. Enjoy the keynote speakers, round tables, the inviter. Uh, session, um, on statistical learning, the short courses, courses, and the poster uh, presentation. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank the scientific program committee for contributing to the success this uh, in event. In, spe in special, my my friend, my gratitude for my my friend. Uh, my colleague, uh, Paulo Canas uh, Rodrigues, for, for leading our team during three uh, months of uh, preparation of the uh, event. He is an uh, outstanding leader, and uh, I admire him so much. It's an inspiration for me, for us. And uh, I'd like to say thanks to other members of my team, my success team, uh, Jean-Marc Carrasco, Rodrigo Bulhões, Christian Paixão, Jairan Dionísio, e os estudantes, the students, João Vitor Rocha e Elizabeth Sampaio. Uh, I special thanks to Jean-Marc, who dedicated uh, himself in the elaboration of the website. He is my husband. I love you so much. Thanks for, for everything. <laughs> and um, it's uh, thank you for uh, sharing your time during three days to, to us. It's a pleasure. It's an honor for, for all of us. Yes, thank you very much. We have nothing else to say, just that in the afternoon in, at 2 p.m. local time, we will still have two courses. Uh, they, will be, they will be great courses, one by David Banks on data science 
and another one by Paulo uh, Ferreira on statistics process control. So don't don't lose that as well. And now the only thing that we have to say is to say goodbye and see you next year. See you next year. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>